The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. Welcome back to a, a new season. And my first guest this year is Alex Ruff, the MP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. But he's got some new portfolios that he's working on, and we're going to talk about that and a whole lot more. Alex, welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, David. Now, as we're taping this, you've just come out of the first caucus meeting with uh, your colleagues in the Conservative Party, uh, the opposition party. Um, we did allow you to get a, a short break for lunch. <laughs> Much appreciated. But, uh, that must have been that must have been an interesting experience because you've got uh, a new leader uh, who was a member of caucus before, and uh, kind of like turning the page, isn't it? It is. I mean, uh, but at the same time, I think it's a continuation of all the hard work that the previous team was doing and, and everything that we were doing as per uh, what the electorate, you know, put us in power, or not put us in power, but, you know, elected us to do, which in this case, us being in the official opposition is to hold the government to account, uh, you know, look at the legislation, make sure the legislation that's coming forth is uh, the best legislation possible for all Canadians. And now we do have a new leader and, uh, I think everybody's sort of pumped up. It's that feeling uh, almost like, a, you know, with back to school, uh, that, that there is a, you know, a huge desire and a, and a sense of optimism um, in a lot of ways from at least uh, those of us in uh, the Conservative Party to get back to work uh, fully uh, in Parliament. And hopefully we'll, we're going to see that happen here in the next couple of weeks. You know, it's funny because we're doing this on Skype. We're not doing this face to face, but even through Skype, I sense I sense your energy and your excitement and your. Uh, I mean, let's face it. It was uh, y you sound pumped. Well, I'm, I'm I am pumped. I'm I'm excited to be you know be to be back in the house. Uh, it's been an interesting. Uh, Spring, obviously, for everybody, as as the country dealt and well, the world dealt with this global pandemic uh, with COVID-19. And so there was some special measures, uh, obviously, adopted in the House with the special committee for a number of months. Uh, then we did have four, well, we were scheduled to have four accountability sessions this uh, this summer. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Prime Minister chose to prorogue Parliament and shut that down, so we missed that last session. Uh, so I think everybody's keen to get back here on the 23rd and get back to sort of normal parliament or whatever we'll see that that looks like. But I think with uh, the economy starting to reopen, schools going back, I think there's going to be a greater desire by all parliamentarians uh, across all the parties to uh, sort of return to some level of normality. Now, when you, you talked about uh, returning to normality before in our last uh, conversation, there was a lot of, um, <clears throat> what do I say, there were a lot of uh, measures in place to protect uh, parliamentarians and to uh, uh, reduce the transmission of COVID. And will you be coming back in the full house or you will be, will you be spaced or will you be part online, part uh, um, in person? What's the, what's the plan uh, well, for the, that, that's the a great, great, great question that we're eagerly awaiting some, uh, you know, indications from the government. They haven't yet really provided that. I know the House, new House leader and the new uh, uh, chief whip, uh, uh, both uh, Gerard Deltel and uh, Blake Richards, uh, the two uh, individuals now appointed to those positions, uh, are, we're expecting additional feedback from uh, the, the government uh, today. Uh, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, by tomorrow morning at the latest on some indications. Um, obviously, the speaker had released something a couple, uh, I, uh, maybe a month or two ago now, it's our time's kind of just warped here, uh, is uh, with respect to the numbers. So even though with the reduced quorum that the all parties had agreed to back in March, um, uh, to 50 being in the House, the speaker has indicated we can safely put 86 uh, in, into the chamber uh, with the respect and the physical distancing and health protocols that have been put in place. And, and again, those are the same protocols we followed uh, today uh, under the direction of uh, the House of Commons administration to say to do this. And so we successfully ran a great caucus meeting today 
uh, National Level Caucus meeting with uh, th those increased numbers in, in the uh, uh, in, in the Save Sir John A. Macdonald building, but and then with the extra overflow in, in a couple different rooms or those in, uh, MPs that couldn't make the trip to uh, to Ottawa, uh, they were able to zoom in and, and we did it. So it was a bit of a hybrid model that we conducted ourselves in, but uh, the vast majority of our 121 person caucus were in person uh, in Ottawa today. And it was just, I think you could sense that optimism and, and sense of, uh, you know, get up and go and energy, I guess, from, uh, from the group, because it, it's when you, you know, I think it's, it's the same as uh, any business or any, sort of uh, social uh, interaction with that lack of social interaction uh, has had a huge impact. And I mean, I've talked to teachers locally, even though, you know, education falls under the provincial jurisdiction, but you know, about the, the strain and stress that's been on our students for the last number of months due to that lack of social interaction, especially with the teenagers. So there's the mental ha health aspect of just getting together and, and being able to interact a little bit while respecting all the necessary health protocols. It's interesting that uh, the way you're describing it sounds very much like the kids getting back to school, that uh, the MPs are excited and they want to get they want to get back doing the business of the country. So that's a, that's a, a good sign. That's a very good sign for all of us. Um, I want to go back a little bit in time, if we can, Alex, because don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to the House of Commons stuff a little later in the program. But I wanted to um, ask you a kind of an obvious question. What did you do all summer? <laughs> well, we, we, we kind of continued on as per normal. Uh, you know, I was I was in the constituency pretty much throughout the whole the whole summer. Uh, and and to, and to be fair, it actually was a you know a slower tempo than I think it would have been normally because we had to respect that. But I mean, I was to a number of events, the ones that still happened outdoors that I was able to participate in. Uh, to, you know, did a lot of uh, calls early. You know, with some of the business communities, with the the ag folks, that never really stopped uh, trying to understand those issues. Obviously, the workflow uh, coming into the office itself was a little bit higher than normal. Uh, obviously, I spent a bunch of time with my daughter, uh, which was great. Uh, you know, we even got a little bit of hay in, in which uh, I'm glad it's just a little bit. The uh, the body's not used to what it what it used to be able to do uh, 20 some odd years ago. So, uh, you know, it's doing it for a, a couple 14, days. You can't do a 14 kilometer ruck march anymore, Alex. Right? Well, no, I, oh, I could do the ruck march. I'm qu quite confident I'm still capable of doing things. It's just that. Uh, Mowing, mowing hay in, uh, up in the in the hayloft. That that's a different type of muscle and a different type of use. And I mean, part of it's just the the lower back and being bent over. And even though I'm the eldest of my brothers, uh, somehow I'm the guy that ends up in the mow when it when it comes hay in time. So uh, it's uh, you know there was a lot of that. As I said, some time with the family, um, lots of. Uh, uh, you know, just sort of getting caught up to some extent. We've got the office up and running full full tilt again. Uh, you know, we still encourage people to book appointments if they want to come through, but we've got all the safety protocols in place there uh, so that we can, you know, control, uh, you know, the numbers coming in the door. So we're respecting everybody's uh, health. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, so that's a number of things, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there were there were a number of uh, meetings early on in the in the thing from a caucus perspective. We met every time uh, before there was an accountability session, so we did that in in July as well. And so uh, just looking forward to kind of getting back to uh, some level of normality. Well, the, the the one thing you didn't mention, of course, is the leadership uh, campaign that was going on, and uh, you were involved in that, I'm sure. Yeah, no, and true. That did occupy a little bit of my, you know, sort of the off-duty hours, if you want to say that. Most of that was done during uh, Zoom calls at night, uh, and uh, you know, from a leader, from Aaron's perspective and the other candidates' perspective. Um, but there was, yeah, there was a little bit of work. I mean, I did volunteer to help out with that a, a bit, obviously, because I was uh, keen to. Uh, see Aaron win the leadership and, and so I wanted to do my part and so it was uh, thankful that things even if you looked at the results locally in Bruce Gray Owen Sound uh, um, you know there was support for all four candidates in her riding uh, however Aaron was successful uh, you know um, from first ballot right through to third ballot which was what my goal was to, to help deliver it to him and I'm glad it happened that way. It was interesting to see the the way it, it kind of felt 
was there a, did you not use a proportional representation system or what was it called what was the, the way that was called the way well, the, it, it, every writing is weighted equally it's exactly the same really as a normal federal election works right in that it, it doesn't matter who wins the most uh, the popular vote uh, you know if that would have been the case we'd be in, we'd be in government right now uh, because uh, Conservative Party and Andrew Scheer actually uh, outperformed uh, uh, the Liberals in, in the October election from a popular vote perspective. However, uh, they were much more efficient in their vote results, the, resulting in their larger number of MPs being elected. So it's the same way uh, in the in for a party leadership race. Every riding is worth 100 points. And so it's it doesn't matter. As you said, I think the riding with maybe the, the fewest number of Conservative uh, members that that chose to vote in the leadership was something like 51, whereas we had over 1,141, I think 1,141 members cast ballots in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. So uh, we're one of the larger uh, uh, riding associations uh, in Ontario. We don't quite top the uh, some of the bigger ones out west, but uh, we do uh, have a a faithful uh, membership that were quite interested in in casting their ballot in the, in this race. And technical considerations aside, because there were some technical issues at the at the very uh, end of the cat the, the night of the the, the announcement, um, it seemed like a, a pretty uh, decent and um, open campaign, and everyone was doing their very best. Of course, I didn't. You know, we, we we never see what's in behind there, and the the arm twisting and leverage that gets placed upon people. But hey, the people were able to vote, and uh, that's the important part. Yeah, the, the the record votes, right? Uh, you know, over two hundred seventy thousand, uh, approximately um, members in the party right now. Over a hundred and sixty thousand, or almost one hundred seventy thousand, can't remember the exact number anymore. Cast the ballots, the most that's been cast for any political party in the history of Canada in a leadership race. So that that's something that you know gives us optimism in our party. That you know that interest. Uh, and, and more people are interested in, in, in the conservative movement. So that's always good. And as you said, the, you know, it's like any leadership race, uh, no matter the party, there's always some, a little bit of divisiveness or, or you know, that, that comes out during that. And I'm just so impressed at not only Aaron's leadership uh, for the la over the last couple of weeks, uh, and, but all the cam campaign teams in the, in the different camps that they recognize the need for, you know, to bring everything back together and, and, and work as a unified front. And that's been the most impressive part of it. And I'd suggest for any Canadians out there, if they didn't get a chance to listen to uh, Aaron's uh, victory speech, uh, it, uh, you know, I've, I'm fortunate enough from my military background to have been exposed to a number of very uh, inspirational leaders and heard some pretty, you know, um, exciting inspiring speeches in my lifetime and I was actually shocked and I've known Aaron for over 25 years uh, you know uh, on just the caliber of that speech he delivered after 1 a.m. in the morning uh, or, or early on the uh, on that Monday morning so uh, it's uh, it's it's worthwhile I think he did a uh, you know shed a lot of positivity and inspiration uh, and a great message for all Canada. Yeah I, I think that if somebody wants to go and and Listen to that. I'm sure that's available somewhere on the internet by just searching mm -hmm. his uh, searching his uh, um, under his name or Conservative Party. Somebody's got it archived somewhere. It's all over YouTube. It's the first thing you'll that'll pop up if you Google uh, Aaron O'Toole victory speech. There you go. There you go. Now, um, as you move through the campaign, um, it it has has culminated, and now we've got. Um, or shall I say the page has been turned to use another metaphor, but tell us about Aaron O'Toole. You've spoken very highly of him. You, you know, you're, you were classmates at RMC, I believe. So what, tell us, tell me, um, tell people about Aaron O'Toole because we've got to get to know him. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, that's actually, I think how, how he opened his speech pretty much, uh, good, you know, good morning. My name's Aaron O'Toole. Uh, and uh, so uh, we weren't classmates. He was a couple years ahead of me at military college, but we were in what we call sister squadrons. I was in two squadrons. He was three squadrons. So we shared the same building uh, for those uh, my first two years at, at the college. So, uh, no, Aaron did, a, you know, he did 12 years in, in uniform, uh, nine years in the reg force as a tactical uh, Sea King navigator. 
So he, he pr participated in the uh, the Swiss air disaster down uh, you know down on the east coast. He so he's got that practical experience uh, in the military, uh, you know, serving serving our country. And then he you know went to law school uh, down on the east coast, and then he's uh, um, became a corporate lawyer. Done a lot of pro bono work you know, with indigenous uh, communities up north, uh, with different organizations. He, he's one of the co-founders of True Patriot Love, which is the largest um, military sort of uh, uh, supporter uh, nonprofit charity out there now. Um, and so he's just he's he's been an individual that's been dedicated to to doing what he can to to serve Canada and and uh, at the same time. You know, he's just an average, you know, he grew up in a, in a very much a blue collared uh, family. His father worked in um, the, the automotive interest industry with GM. Uh, and so uh, he grew up down in the Oshawa area uh, after actually, though, although he was born in Montreal. And then since then, uh, you know, his father actually he's following a bit in his father's footsteps. His father was actually a long term uh, member of provincial parliament uh, here in Ontario. So, uh, He's uh, he's he's got some interesting backgrounds, but I think really when you reach out to him uh, or people listen to him, the thing that's going to most impress them is is that Aaron's, you know, there's substance to him, and he's authentic at the same time, and and anybody can approach him and, and reach out to him. He, he there's nothing fake about Aaron. Uh, Aaron is just who he is. Uh, I think he's a great leader. Um, but he understands what every you know average Canadians go through on a daily basis, and. Uh, he, he, I think he's going to come up. He, he recognizes our job as the opposition is is to hold the government to account. But at the same time, he understands that if we want to demonstrate to Canadians that we're a government in waiting, we got to come up with some solid platforms, some uh, some good uh, um, policies that will resonate with Canada and all Canadians. And I I, I think you're going to see that forthcoming. In fact, I mean, he's put a lot of it on paper when he ran for the leadership three years ago. And finished third to Andrew Shearer, and Maxime Bernier. Um, that was as a relatively new uh, new uh, member of Parliament. He had only got elected in the by-election in 2012. But his policy document was over 70 some odd pages even then. And he cut it back a little bit because uh, you know he recognizes that not every person's going to want to read a 70-page document. But I think his document's still 50 pages long. And it covers every pretty much every issue out there. And, and again, so people should really just go to AaronOtool.ca slash platform and you can read what his platform was for the leadership campaign. That doesn't mean that's the identical platform word for word that the party would run on in a national campaign. Because again, the other great thing about Aaron, Aaron listens to people. He listens to his own caucus. He's going to listen to more importantly, all Canadians. And he's not afraid to modify or change or, you know, um, evolve uh, a platform or a policy or an idea uh, based on good, solid feedback. So I think that's, you know, those are some highlights about what I think about Aaron and, and why I'm quite happy and, and impressed to see him at the helm. Yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting. you should say that, John, because, um, Alex, because uh, I knew um, his father, John O'Toole. Um, uh, John was uh, not just an MPP for uh, the, the riding of Durham in the east side, on the east end of uh, uh, Durham region, but he was also... Um, uh, mayor of Clarington, or uh, yes, mayor of Clarington, and also um, uh, I sus don't think he was ever a warden of uh, or uh, regional chair of uh, of Durham Region, but certainly he was he would have been active at the regional political level. So um, it, if it isn't in the DNA, <laughs> it's uh, it's certainly a part. He, he's uh, Aaron is certainly a descendant of a of a political family, that's for sure. And I did notice in the uh, shots I saw of the, uh, uh, the when he was given the word that he had won, there was his dad right there. His dad and his mom were all right there supporting him, which was uh, kind of good to see. It's been a long time since I've seen John, but uh, yeah, good to see. Good to see. Now, uh, one of the things that that we are um, that comes up in Canadian politics, and you can you probably can answer this, is um, how will Aaron O'Toole play in Quebec? Because uh, he's got to be bilingual. That's that's kind of a given. Uh, and Mr. Shear was. Uh, was competent bilingual, competent in French, but he's got Aaron's got to be able to go in and and 
and meet the people in Quebec where uh, where they are. And uh, he's it's not so much the liberals that are the, shall I say the the roadblock there. It's the Bloc Québécois, because they are. That's been the the, the way the, the the politics have have divided for for decades. So do you think he has a chance to make an advance for the party in Quebec? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, the, the reason Aaron won the leadership more than anything was the the fact he won Quebec. Uh, during the leadership race, uh, you know, he impressed everybody there. He impressed me. Like I, I knew, in fact, when Aaron first, uh, you know, in January, him and I had sort of a, a discussion, uh, you know, when he was sort of contemplating uh, throwing his name into the hat again and, and, and running for the leadership. Uh, you know, that was one of the critiques or, or warnings I gave him at the time. I said, hey, I, I haven't heard you speak a lot of French, uh, you know, recently. That's something you're going to have to work on, you know, because it's something. And he's been working on it to the point where I participated, watched a number of his Zoom calls uh, in, in with the Quebec, uh, Quebecers. And I was shocked at his, A, not only his French, but at his, his comprehension. Like, I, I like to think I can understand most of it and, and can, get, can get by. Uh, but there was some of the questions, and in particular, and you've seen, I've seen him now performing with the French media. He, he understands the nuances, and he, and he can get right to it. And even his pronunciation is, is way better than I ever gave him credit for. And he's uh, to the point where our Quebec colleagues are like, wow. Like I've I've been in the room even you know where Aaron's speaking French, and I don't look at him. I'm looking at the Quebecers in the room, the francophones, and you can judge then you you know on how well he's performing. So so that that the language thing aside, because again, um, we've got some interesting examples in our Canadian history of of different prime ministers and leaders, uh, you know, being questionable uh, you know performance in either official languages in some cases, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so I think Aaron's, uh, you know, he's got that forte and that competency in, in the language itself. Uh, but what one of the things, too, that I think appealed to a lot of the uh, conservative members in Quebec, Aaron, Aaron actually had a specific platform for Quebec to address some of their concerns and, and you know, and issues because they are a distinct culture and it's been recognized, uh, you know, uh, even, you know, under the previous uh, conservative government as, as a distinct nation. And so, therefore, um, Aaron recognizes that. So I, I think you're going to see him do a lot better. And, and again, your, your comment commentary about the block, I mean, it is kind of sad, I, you know, you know, and I'm not a political historian by by any stretch. I'm sure you, you're much more up to speed. But when you look at where the block came out of uh, in the 80s, uh, a lot of them came from the Conservative Party. And uh, however, under the um, under Harper, the Bloc Québécois basically ceased to exist. You know, they were down to a few seats left, six seats, I think, left in the House of Commons. And unfortunately, since uh, since the government has changed over, that's where you've, we've seen some of this, uh, you know, d d d change, you know, I'm trying to think, divisiveness, uh, you know, come into the country here a little bit, or in particular in Quebec and out west. Uh, but, you know, the Bloc have risen up again uh, just in the last five years to where they are third party status and, and have a lot of influence in the House of Commons, which, again, at no, I have no critique against the individual MPs. There, a lot of them are just great people and they're doing their best to represent their constituents. Uh, but I always question when you, when you have a party in the House who's sort of one of their main purposes is to separate from the from the country right so uh it, 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 and so I, I believe canada first that should always be that way i mean obviously i'm a little bit biased towards the constituents of bruce gray owen sound myself uh, however you know we're all in this for as a country and as a nation it's interesting you mentioned that uh, alex because the um uh, in 2012 as i recall that was the the election of orange crush when uh uh, Jack Layton led the uh, the NDP and basically what wiped Quebec turned Quebec orange, and uh, that was the result that left the um, uh, the the Bloc and anybody else kind of out and out, out out of the out of the picture. At the same time, um, it, it swung back uh, into the Liberal hands in, in the last election. It will be always interesting to see what will happen. Uh, in the next election, 
whenever that's going to be. And, and we're going to get to that in a minute, believe me. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to see that that regional nature of, of this country and the various parties. Um, one of the comments that has been made is that um, the Conservative Party currently has a strong uh, leaning to the West and and rural Ontario, which is, I think, very both of them are reasonable and fair comments. Do you think that's going to um, cause Mr. O'Toole a, a bit of a challenge? Because okay, he's got a base, but he's got to work. He's got to work outside his base to to win the next election. No, absolutely. I mean, nobody. That's not a hidden. Uh you know, secret or anything, uh, you know, we recognize fully uh, as the uh, as the Conservative Party that in order to form government, you have to win seats uh, right across this nation. Um, you know, the, the Liberals have demonstrated you can you can form government without the West because they basically got shut out of the West, um, which isn't good. Whereas we do got representation. We need more representation in the Maritimes. We need to do better in Quebec. And we need to do better in the 905. Uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we fully acknowledge that your suburban parts of the country around your major urban centers are where a majority of, I think, your what you call your swing voters reside. And they're the ones that ultimately will impact and affect. And I think that's one of the great things about Aaron. Aaron understands this. He's been reelected or elected or reelected three times now in the greater Toronto area in the exact part of the country where we need to form uh, to win more seats in order to form government. So Aaron's, he gets that. He understands this wholeheartedly and he understands where we can make inroads. Uh, you know, he's got roots, as I said, across the country. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to get there. I mean, I'm optimistic. It's interesting. You mentioned his own history because uh, as I recall, I lived in that riding back in the 90s, and it was represented by um, Alex Buchanan, who was a liberal, and then it went to a, it went conservative, and there was some rejigging of the of the boundaries, which actually caused um, that change, near as near as I could tell, and um, the minister who came in was the infamous, I believe the the minister who. Um, I'm pretty sure she was a the orange the 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 ten dollar yeah, orange juice yeah, yeah Bev I, Oda that's that's the name Bev Oda and then Alan then um, Aaron won but what's really interesting about that writing is that it's very much um, although it's changed it's it's a predominantly rural writing because it's it's long it goes it's the east side of Durham region it goes up uh, up well it did go up as far as uh, Beaverton uh, you know it was, it was it's quite a long ride quite quite a, and quite a rural riding but it's changing because uh, it's the very eastern edge of the GTA so it's uh, Alec, or, um, Aaron has done done well don't get me wrong uh, um, but I having lived there there's some there were, when I, I lived there, some very true blue conservatives <laughs> who would have worked, at, who who would have given the true blue conservatives here in, in Bruce Gray Owen Sound um, a run for their money, <laughs> if I could say that. Uh, wonderful people, I have to say, just wonderful people. But uh, yeah, it's it, it will be a very very interesting time as we uh, as we go forward. Now. Um, before we get into sort of going forward, um, what I was going to ask you very briefly is, um, what do the next two weeks hold for you? And then after we're gonna, what we're going to do is I want to hear about that, and then we'll take a break, and we'll talk about your new role and, uh, and what is going to happen afterwards. So what do, you, what do the next two weeks hold for you, Alex? Well, so I just got a few things to finish up. We've got a couple more meetings here uh, over the next couple days, and then I'll be heading back uh, back home on uh, Sunday, uh, back to the riding for the week. I do have some uh, caucus uh, meetings uh, at the regional side from an Ontario side over uh, in Alliston next week uh, during the middle part of the week, but then I'm, I'm basically back in the riding all next week. And then, uh, then we're back here, and we'll have meetings kicking off, even though Parliament doesn't reconvene until the 23rd. Um, we'll be back. We got meetings already booked in on the 21st. So, uh, there, you know, there'll be, I think my schedule is going to be fairly busy, uh, working with, uh, Mr. Richards and, and, uh, the, the house leadership team, uh, once we get a little bit more fidelity from the, from the government and the other opposition parties and coming up with sort of 
what we think uh, Parliament's going to fully look like and, and try to get as much of that negotiated ahead of time uh, so that there's some semblance of uh, agreement going into the way we think things should look and, and move forward uh, because ideally, you know, we're there to, to work for Canadians and I think everybody, we won't agree on all aspects, but ultimately I think all the parties want to want to get back to work and get uh, get back to the House. And that's a great segue into what we'll talk about after the break, Alex, because uh, that that is really where you are. You're right in the middle of that. But uh, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back with Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. can allow a carry of a couple of steps. And hey, Mr. Naismith, sir, it sure slows things down having to climb up here every time. Well, then let's cut the bottom out of the basket. Ah, but I need these baskets back. A hundred years after James Naismith from Almont, Ontario invented it, basketball was being played by hundreds of millions of people around the world. What kind of show do you want to see on Rogers TV? What interests you? Log on to rogerstv.com, fill out a show proposal, and tell us about your segment idea. We want to know what you want to see. Rogers TV, only on Rogers. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guest is Alex Roff, MP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound, and we're just on the cusp of a, a new session of Parliament, and we're talking about what Alex has been doing, They're his new leader, Aaron O'Toole, and of course, we're going to get into what's next. Alex, welcome back. Thanks again for having me, Dave. It's uh, great to be here. Now, I hinted at the pact, and we've talked to sort of. Uh, I've pushed it back a bit, but you've got a brand new role in uh, in the house and with the party. Uh, if I can describe it, your your title is deputy opposition whip, but I thought it was really interesting uh, when uh, Aaron O'Toole released the uh, the the full document with the shadow cabinet. Um, it's a lovely wall chart. I don't know whether there's a big wall chart version of it, but it's a wall chart. And, of course, he's in the center, and below is the shadow cabinet, obviously. But above that is the House of Commons leadership team, and there you are in your position of, of deputy opposition whip. If I read that correctly, it's kind of like a division between policy and operations. Is that a reasonable way of describing the team, the two teams that he's got in place? Actually, I think it's a, it is a pretty good way to describe. I never thought of it that way. I mean, I used the word operations myself in sort of describing my role when I was doing a, an interview, I think, with uh, Bayshore Broadcasting there a, a week or two, I guess two weeks ago now. It's crazy how fast time goes. Um, actually, no, it was just last week. And uh, it, that's the way it was described. Like, you know, one of the descriptions was sort of what I, you know, my role or really my bo my direct boss, i.e. Uh, Blake Richards as the chief whip, is to sort of be the vice principal of the school, you know. Uh, but the other way I look at it, it, it is that day-to-day -day operational side of the house for how the house runs. What, what are those big issues um, that are going on and making sure we have the you know the right number of uh, MPs present that they're everybody's accounted for, uh, not only in the House, uh, you know it's in particular important when there's votes going on, 
Uh, and then secondly, uh, in all the committee work uh, that, that's going on and that we're, we're aware of that. But I think, you know, what I consider the, the real privilege and, and I'm, I'm thankful for Aaron giving me this opportunity is uh, it just allows me to be that sort of uh, sounding board and a little bit, you know, the frank advice to him. Um, you know, that's the one thing that I've told him from day one. And I, I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if I, he would have put me in this position or not. Uh, I, he would have got it from me anyway, right? Uh, because, sure. uh, you know, that's just who I am. And I think we have a, a history in this riding, uh, both provincially and federally, of, uh, of having MPs that aren't afraid to, you know, speak up. Uh, and represent their constituents uh, wholeheartedly. So, um, but but I think you're right. A, a good way to describe the the difference between the two sort of uh, split their division of work or labor within the within the team uh, is your shadow ministers are focused very much on uh, on the policy aspects, looking in, quite in depth into all the, the their respective uh, counter government's legislation uh, that impacts their specific portfolio coming up with, uh, you know, uh, critique uh, and, and ways to improve it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, working the, you know, really in reality, you know, what our platform would be or what we think would be a, a better way to, uh, to solve the puzzle. Uh, whereas ultimately, we're there to sort of, you know, my role is a bit more involved in the sort of let's make sure everything's working on a day to day basis and, and, and stay focused uh, in, in, in the way forward. Yeah, because I see that um, on the policy side, there's some fam very familiar names. I mean, Pierre Poilevre is back um, in finance. Uh, Mr. Scheer is also um, back in, in the shadow cabinet as infrastructure and communities. Um, but there's other familiar names that Marilyn glad you. Um, I'm just looking at the some of the, the ones that I, I recognize right off, off the top. Um, Rob Morrison for national security. The Honourable Peter Kent for Employment, Workforce Development, and uh, Disability Inclusion. Um, that's a, that's another uh, long time member going back many years. But the the operations side is is equally interesting because you've got yourself plus Candace Bergen, um, a very clear Quebec Lieutenant in Richard Martel, and it's uh, it looks like a a very very interesting. Um, group to work with. Now, I wanted to ask you, you you referred to the number of people making sure that all the MPs were present and accounted for or and were, were there. But there's also, um, I understand, and my memory could be wrong, there's an agreement that you may be responsible for um, between the parties that, for example, if someone has to be away because they're sick or family emergency, there, there's a balance. So that, um, is there a, a, a correlation between, if you have one that's on, that has to be away, you're someone else, um, ha, there's an equality. Parity, it's called parity. Parity, yes. And, and so, yeah, there's something unofficially that way. There's no current official agreements. That's the one thing when you prorogue, uh, everything gets thrown in the garbage. That's the one thing I don't know if all uh, all Canadians understand fully is that when the Prime Minister prorogued Parliament, even every single one of pieces of their introduced legislation go back to square one. All the committees stopped, uh, and so a lot of progress got thrown in the in the trash bin uh, when when the government was prorogued. And so, uh, but that includes sort of the agreements that we had for hybrid sittings, the agreement for reduced representation in the House, uh, and even something like pairing. So there, 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 that is a policy or a procedure um, or practice, I guess is a better word, that has been used historically. It's still is normally used. It's normally initiated more at the uh, bequest of the government not not the opposition parties uh, and it's the government asking to do that when they have to have a minister travel um, or something like that because obviously and then what they'll do then especially if there's a shadow minister let's just take defense for example if you you look historically over the last few years with uh, Minister Sajan who's been the minister for for since uh, since the Liberals formed government and James Bazan who's been the defense shadow minister uh, a lot of the time when the minister travels, if the, if, if the situation allows, he will take his, the shadow ministers from the opposition parties with him. So James sometimes travels with them and, and you know, you, you provide that thing. And at, at the same time, it protects the sort of integrity of the election results, because if not, and, and, you know, if the government takes too many of their, their people away, 
um, it, you know, it could lead to them getting defeated uh, in the House. And, and I believe that the government, not this government, we're going back probably 40 or 50 years. That has happened. It's been very, very close, and uh, governments okay. have been brought down. Yeah, yeah, no government's been brought down recently that I'm aware, but there have, because they weren't confidence votes. When they're confidence votes, normally yeah. there's a lot more uh, detail or uh, um, attention to detail uh, put into it. However, um, there, there have been votes in both uh, the previous conservative government and even in the previous session, from my understanding, that didn't go the way of, of the government of the day uh, because of somebody messed up a little bit, right? Or it, it resulted in, you know, it, it got, it, yeah, it got interesting to say the least, apparently. So, uh, yeah, that'll be part of my, to stay on top of that. And, and, and again, um, the unique challenge that we have right now is, uh, at the same time, holding and making sure we're following through once an agreement is struck between the different parties, that you don't have too many people in there. And 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 again, that's where it really gets tricky because when you talk about you know about a lot of MPs, regardless of party affiliation, that they're there to represent their constituents, and there's a lot of pressure from their constituents, as I said, regardless of what party they're there, uh, the 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 banner that they're under to be there and, and their constituents expect them to be there. But when you are for health reasons, like right now, uh, or, you know, over the last number of months that you're, you, you've agreed to a reduced number, um, you, you have to, you know, you have to find that fine balance. And some MPs, it's their privilege to be in the house. Like it doesn't really matter what agreement there is. Uh, the house of commons is a unique spot. And as an MP, you, you have been, be, uh, bestowed some very unique, uh, privileges and you can't nobody can stop you from being there kind of deal so the challenge is to to work that and make people understand not make them encourage them to understand uh you know the the reasons why and the complexity and again it you know to allow the in in the case now uh blake richards that it, you know if he's the one that's made that agreement with the other parties you know to be a be a person of his word and and, and to respect that and so you know, it, it, it's it's all about teamwork and, and being and working together, and I think that's the key thing that uh, you'll see. And that's what's most, as I said earlier, what's most impressed me uh, is just how quickly our whole team's very, very focused and unified um, on on doing what's best for Canadians and 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 getting getting refocused after the sort of the internal uh, competition for for lack of better words to now focus back on what uh, Canadians elected us to do. I, I suspect, Alex, you're going to find it's probably as complicated, if not more complicated, than having oversight and leadership of a battalion of troops. <laughs> well, I, I, it's, a, it's a lot more nuanced for certain. And, and again, uh, we have a chain of command uh, within, the, uh, uh, within the Canadian Armed Forces, right, or within a battalion. So when you're, when you're the CEO... You know, I can remember it was a brand new second lieutenant up in three RCR and, and, you know, the CO for, you know, lack of better words, we thought you thought he was God almost right uh, because, uh, you know, what he said went and, and, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense at all. Uh, you know, they were just, uh, it was impressive to see and, you know, and, and, and that's the way that the chain of command functions. We have a semi chain of command, I guess you could say within a political party. However, ultimately, uh, we're all there, and the people that we all work for is the people that elected us and, and, our, and our constituents. So ultimately, that's where, um, you know, it's a lot more nuanced, and, and, and you, have to, uh, you have to balance those com sometimes competing interests um, depending on uh, the issue, right? Because there's some issues that are very regionally focused, and just because... You know, it's maybe something in a case in Bruce Gray on sound that, hey, we need, we really want to see this go forward, yet maybe it's not the best thing uh, for Canada. It might be the best thing for our area of the country, but it's not necessarily the best thing, and that's always the fine balance. And then if that is the case, for an example, uh, that, that impacted us, then that's my job to explain to the constituents of the riding to say, Here, here's why this decision was made, or here's why we voted the way we voted, or I voted the way I voted. And ultimately, I have no issue. It's called being accountable. Uh, you know, you know I, I challenge you. I challenge all the uh, all the constituents of Bruce Gray and Sound to hold me to account. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in in doing what you say you're going to do, and at the same time, uh, the 
the responsibility fully stops with me, right? Uh, I, I'm the one that was elected, and I and I have no problem accepting that responsibility and being held to account for it. One of the things you said earlier was the impact of COVID-19 on the community. Um, impact of COVID-19, um, you know, it's it's obviously on the House of Commons. It's it's caused a huge amount of change in the way you do things, um, but. Um, Stepping forward as we as the house comes back in a couple of weeks, um, do you think that we will see um, changes, not just operational changes in the way house does things, but will there be lessons learned? Uh, do you think the government will be introducing policies? Do you do you think that there will be um, uh, some changes that you'll that will will be maybe in the throne speech that uh, we'll all be waiting upon with bated breath? Well. Uh... I, I, you know, that's the million dollar question really, right, is, is what is going to be in that throne speech. I think we've seen some trial balloons released by the by the government already that's been, you know, either leaked to the media and some of the stories that have been running, just how big of a deficit, you know, are they going to run um, going forward? You know, the number, the hundred billion more dollars have been bandered around. That could be, that could be them just saying, hey, we're going to spend this much, you know, this is how much more money we're going to run. And then when it comes out, this, the, this uh, speech from the throne may only have $40 billion additional spending. So, and then it'll be like, oh, all right, see, it can't be that, it's not that bad. We're, we're only spending another $40 billion. Uh, you know, on top of the 343 billion that's already been uh, been spent this year, so I have no idea. You know, they've uh, what it's going to be and exactly what it's going to be look like. I, I think it's not. It wouldn't be fair to, um, you know, determine you know whether or not there's going to be some. I, I'm my assumption there should be some great stuff in there. The uh, my my other assumption is that there's going to be some parts in there that philosophically. Uh, I will be personally opposed to, and that, and that my party will be opposed to. But to be fair to them, let's wait and see what they put forth. It's still, a, you know, a few weeks, a couple of weeks at least here before that's going to be released. And uh, again, as Aaron's clearly stated, I mean, that's the, that's the job. We're there to work for Canadians and make the best legislation go forward. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of policies policies they bring forward and uh, what they're looking to do. Well, we. The um, some would say that the um, the Wee scandal for, forced Bill Morneau out of cabinet, and uh, he he won't run again. He has said and he has resigned, I believe, as a, as an MP. Um, so some would say that well, that that's going to be a change, and Christian Freeland is the new Minister of Finance, and um, although she's she's a respected uh, scholar and author and journalist. Uh, It'll be interesting to see what her what her proposals are coming forward. No, absolutely. Uh, as you said, uh, you know she, she's uh, you know to give her credit, she's uh, obviously uh, hasn't had been tarnished with the same same brush as some of these scandals. Although interesting enough, when you mentioned the Wee scandal, uh, she she was chairing the cabinet committee, the special COVID uh, you know uh, government committee. Uh, that made the decisions on awarding that contract to the WE Charity Foundation, uh, you know, which was that new third party, third organization of WE that was stood up with that. So again, I think that's, you know, I, I personally, that's what bothers me a little bit is some of the hypocrisy that's come out of the government, you know, and, you know, hey, kudos to them when they, when they, when they won in 2015 on running on being an open, transparent government that will never, ever parole parliament um, and, and again, fascinating enough. Five years later, they they've they've done that. When, as as I said, if they if they needed a new throne speech, a I'm not a, as I said an expert on whether or not you actually need to prorogue to to call a new sp throne speech. But even if you do have to go through that method in order to do it, uh, we could have they could have done that on the 21st of September, prorogued it for 48 hours, and had us all back on the 23rd. So I I don't quite buy the the, the sandwich that they've been feeding us. Uh, and, and you know, over the last few weeks, well, the British parliamentary system is a very. They are, of course, we, we both are Westminster systems, and but they're they're when the, when the house is prorogued in England, uh, it is only for a week, and you come back with a speech. Uh, Canada has always had a longer term for whatever reason, and I'm not I haven't done any delving into it, but we do have a, a practice of a longer term for 
for proroguing the parliament. And, uh, you know, one way or the other, we'll, we'll, we'll get something new and people will have a, have a choice. Well, I don't know if we'll have a choice. I mean, proroguing parliament doesn't mean that there's going to be a, a, a federal election. I mean, I'm hopeful that there's not, right? You know, because I don't think right now there's too many unknowns. And as much as I, I you know, I fundamentally am not super happy with uh, the, the current leadership of, of the government, um, I don't think that should be what we should be focused on right now. We should be focused on, on Canadians and bringing forth the best legislation possible. And so, um, interesting enough to, you know, on the, uh, on proroguing, uh, the, it was this current government that brought forth, well, in the previous session, brought forth the, uh, the necessity for them to actually, within, I think, 20 sitting days, to provide a written explanation to Canadians publicly why they prorogue parliament. I'm pretty sure it's public. I know it has to come to the House anyway, but I'm pretty sure it's a public document as well. So it'll be interesting to see what, how they rationalize why they, it was ne uh, necessary to prorogue. So, uh, and as you said, we'll see what they come. I mean, I, you can't, I agree that the situation's fundamentally changed from uh, the election last fall. And uh, so refocusing is absolutely possible. I just think there was lots of ways they could have done that uh, uh, without necessarily proroguing it. And it was even more frustrating when two days after they prorogued, they brought forth another $37 billion worth of uh, legislation to help Canadians that they've now can't introduce because they prorogued until after we reconvene and kind of go through this other that. And meanwhile, some of the benefits that are tied to that new legislation uh, and, you know, what, tied to CERB, tied to this new, uh, I think, Canadian uh, or Canada recovery benefit and, and, and enhanced EI is that they can't, you know, the current pro suite of programs ends at the end of September. So they're not even going to be able to technically get it through. So it's, to me, it's a little bit like, you know, holding the, holding the, um, uh, you know, th almost threatening us opposition uh, parties to say, hey, you know, uh, you know, if you you need to do this, otherwise this legislation won't go through because if we fall and we got to go to the election, none of that will get passed because obviously the, the uh, parliament will be dissolved. So, uh, you know, I've never been a big fan, regardless of uh, who's in government, of the, the political games. Let's just focus on doing our best to, to support and represent Canadians. Uh, I, I share your your um, lack of desire for a December election <laughs> or a November or December election. That's that's and particularly in the midst of a pandemic. That's uh, well, a, we will see what happens. We may be end up we may end up there, but uh, it, winter elections, having been through a few over the years, they're no fun, no fun at all. And uh, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess, Alex. Um, so you're going back to the House, you'll be back in the House a few days before, or in Ottawa, a few days before the House reconvenes, and uh, you, you'll be going through the ceremony of a speech from the throne, and uh, all that uh, pomp and circumstance and stuff, and uh, you all wear your best bib and tucker, and, and uh, the, the Supreme Court justices wear their ermine robes, and uh, the, the Governor General does her thing, and away we go. It's going to be fascinating to see what it looks like in in this COVID environment, because obviously, uh, unlike uh, the throne speech last October or November, I guess, whenever it was, uh, I guess it was November before it was actually delivered, um, you know, we were all jammed in there. I mean, not everybody could even fit because of, uh, obviously, the Senate... Uh, uh, being in a temporary new location as well, so it just wasn't. I was jammed in the back corner, you know, kind of deal in behind, not even in the actual Senate chamber. Uh, so you could kind of watch it. Uh, you were there, but uh, it, you know, whereas now I think the vast majority of it'll be done with a very reduced uh, representation uh, from the the House of Commons side of the House, and uh, um, we'll see how it all plays out. Right. So yeah, that that's. Uh, Lots more to be sort of figured out, and 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 uh, within the respective administration staffs of both the House of Commons and the Senate. Yes, and it will be, uh, um, and what shall I say? Um, not just a, an important moment in history; it'll be an important moment just in, in Parliament, simply because uh, we've never been in COVID before. This is all a new way of of being government, 
And uh, for yourself as, as whip, you've got a, not just the traditional and historic role of the whip, but you've also got as part of the operations team, how do you navigate the, the house in, in this very different time? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what changes both the government, the government proposes uh, as a result of COVID and uh, what, uh, what things um, actually get passed, because that'll be uh, what everyone will, what everyone will be watching. No, absolutely. Yeah. Alex, um, so you, you, you said you'll be in the, in the riding just uh, for a, about a week or so. And um, so I presume that if people want to reach out to you, they can contact you through the, uh, your constituency office and, and set up an appointment. Uh, are, are you finding that you're able to do m more work by Zoom now? Are you, you able to talk to constituents uh, um, using um, various teleconferencing software like we're using? For the for the groups, right? The Chamber of Commerce is the, the you know the beef farmers, the you know uh, any of those type uh, municipalities. Uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough I, I listen in and uh, you know more as a just to listen to get a feel for it with the uh, uh, regional sort of uh, I think it's Gray Gray County sort of chairs it uh, Recovery Task Force and and some of the different groups that that do that. So that's where if it's a group meeting, definitely using a lot more. But when it comes to individual one on one, the vast majority hasn't really changed. Uh, it's still majority sort of uh, either email or personal phone calls. Um, and uh, there are the occasional person that wants to come in and uh, and we do do a uh, face to face. As I said, we set up the office and you know it's big enough that we can keep her keep her distance, wear a mask, and have that uh, that safe conversation interaction. And you know the staff are all set up. so, you know, we're only one constituent into the office at a time. We spray her down before the next uh, constituent uh, is coming in. So uh, we've got all those measures uh, put in place. And I'm hopeful. I mean, it's one of the questions I'm actually going to follow up here uh, um, with the uh, with the government and Service Canada is, is, is something I've been asking for a while now, including a, I, I think the very first time I was in the House in April and I recognized uh, how do we help out those Canadians uh, that have limited internet and limited phone, even phone access, and uh, you know, for, for, you know, and the most vulnerable in a lot of cases that can't afford to sit on hold for for days on end because they maybe they only have a cell phone and they have limited minutes and they can't be on hold. I said, what is their plan to reopen uh, Service Canada offices for you know, and in a safe manner and. Uh, to, I think the last time I stood up in June was I even volunteered to help them. I'll go put in their plexiglass for them if they want me to. Uh, it's not that hard to put in that stuff. We've got to go, but I wanted to thank you again for your time today on Politically Speaking, and uh, we'll be talking again. Hopefully, uh, best wishes in, your, in the uh, next session of Parliament. Thanks so much, David. And thank you, friends. I'm David Shearman. My guest has been Alex Ruff, MPP MP, MP for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. <laughs> Take care. We'll talk to you again. Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. $400 on footballs, but not with sending